Um, Mary, from early 2014 on to wherever the claims are finally settled, you, a new CEO, when this problem arose, you have dealt with an ignition safety issue that caused the deaths of at least 13 people, exposed the deep cracks in General Motors cu culture, and led to the recall of many millions of cars. One thing you brought to that crisis was an engineering degree and a career track that put you in many um, engineering jobs. My question, uh, which may be minor and may be not, my question is how much did your engineering background help you in dealing with that trouble? Or were there times when your background was almost a handicap and that you had to deal harshly with people you had sort of grown up with? Well, I, I think overall having an engineering degree uh, was very important because it, there was, we had to understand, you know, what didn't go right in the engineering process that allowed this to happen or in the, the diagnosis uh, process once we knew we had an issue. So being able to have that background and, and the problem solving, I think, what, I think was definitely an asset. I mean, you know, we had to take the right action, so, so that was uh, difficult, but that was an engineering base that, you know, that would, there were people that I knew, but it was, it was the right thing to do. <laughs> and um, that crisis, and I think your natural instincts too, have left you trying hard to change GM's culture. Although, as I understand it, you'd rather lose, use some different language, which is make GM people behave differently. Now, the streets are littered with GM CEOs who tried to change the culture. And that, that culture has historically included innumerable committees, a, re, a reluctance to take bad news to, your high, to the higher ups, and a similar reluctance to fire people for bad performance. You were quoted in a Fortune story as saying, although many dealers probably wouldn't agree with this, the company was essentially too nice. So what can you report to us about the progress you've made? Where do you stand on committees? Have you brought them back after they were all killed by your ba a bankruptcy predecessor, Ed Whitaker? He killed them all. What aspect of your campaign to change behavior has gone the smoothest, and what have you where have you run into real trouble? Well, I, first, I, I do. We are working to change the culture of General Motors, and I think we're well on our way on that journey. The reason I talked about not wanting to talk about culture, but wanting to talk about behaviors, is because I can go in every day, and if somebody says, "Well, how am I going to change the culture today?" That's pretty tough. <laughs> uh, but if I go in, and how can I change the way I behave? How can I make sure you know my leadership team, and how can we demonstrate the right behaviors for everyone who works there? That's something I can do every minute of every day. And so that's why I really wanted to focus on what are the right behaviors the behaviors that empower people, that engage people, that make sure people know, we want to know if they have a concern or a problem. One of the very uh, measurable things we did is we put in a Speak Up for Safety program, and we actually recognize people when they bring issues forward. So that was just a, a, you know, a very clear way for us to signal to people, we do want to hear from you, and if you're worried about something, I'm worried about it. And so not only in that process do we have people raise issues, but we make sure if there's a problem, we address it. But if there's not, we help them understand why it's okay. So, you know, that's the, the way you change behaviors, that you tell people, you, you know, you demonstrate what you want. You don't just say it, you do it. And then you also, um, you know, make sure, make sure people know what you ask for is, is real. And so I think that's just one example of what we're doing. Clearly, we have more work to do. But I think we're well on our way. And also, you know, through the crisis, one of the key things we drove into the company was uh, the value of the customer. We had actually changed our values the year before to three simple values of the customer, relationships, and excellence. And we demonstrated every step of the way as we dealt with issues last year that we're going to put the customer at the center of everything we do. Uh, we were going to be transparent. And we were going to also then change the processes. So when you get to your comment about or question about committees, you know, we put a vehicle together that has over 30,000 parts. So we need processes uh, to make sure that we design the vehicle correctly, that we engineer it, that we validate, that we test it. So process is important, but process can't be more important than the ultimate outcome of how well the product operates. And I think that's what one of the major changes we've made. At the end of the day, it's how is the customer going to think and feel about our car, and are we putting the safest, highest quality vehicles on the road?
Well, now that makes me think the way you said that, that there's still quite a few committees out there. Would that be true? Um, you know, I would say there's the groups of people that need to work together. I mean, uh -huh. that, so we clearly need that. I, and, and we have a very well-defined process that we use to develop um, car trucks and crossovers, you know, from when they're just a, an idea in someone's head until they're, you know, there's a million of them on the road. We have a very well-defined process. You need that. And because you're bringing 30,000 parts together, not one person understands all the technical aspects. So yes, there's times where we have teams. I'm not a big fan of the word committee, mm -hmm. uh, but you know we have teams. And but we also one of the clear things we did is for every team structure that we have, there's one person accountable. I see. And that and that is a real change. I, I would say that's uh, clarity that we didn't always have before. I see. I see. Um, and this might be a good time to bring up Volkswagen. Um, um, <laughs> You're um, really good. <laughs> well, I wonder um, uh, the dishonesty in testing program. I had lunch with someone who's been in Europe and says that you don't, the number of times you run into conversation about this is just almost every conversation. People are really, in Europe, are really shaken up about this. Um, and I just wonder, do you think that's an isolated problem applying only to Volkswagen? Or could we find something similar like this emerging from GM? No, I, I don't think you'll find something similar to that emerging from GM. Uh, you know, we, um, you know, we have, again, this is where I talk about process, but the importance of process, because not only uh, is it the engineer and the work they're doing, but it also is reviewed by other uh, individuals that understand what the requirements and the regulations are. Of, uh, of, of our products on a whole you know, myriad of, of requirements, whether it's safety requirements, crash requirements, fuel economy emissions, et cetera. So, okay. no. Okay, all right, well, we'll be, we'll be reading the newspapers and, and hoping, making sure that it doesn't come. Um, now, back in uh, 2006, when I wrote a fortune story about GM, you had a revenue problem. When you look at your revenues today, there's not climbing very much. So you still seem to have a revenue problem, though you've obviously been helped by the fact that trucks are just going off the shelves um, in just every minute. But you haven't been gaining share. Now, how do you fix the revenue problem, particularly concerning that you're dealing today with killer competition, some of it being thrown at you by people like Elon Musk? Uh, what's special today about GM that should make new car buyers buy GM? Well, I think if you look at the revenue issue to begin with, and you go just back a few years, we have flat revenue, but what we've done is substantially improve the business. We've grown margins. We've gotten out of places where it just didn't make sense for, for General Motors to be, that we weren't going to be able to get in a sufficient return for our owners on the capital. Uh, and, and so we've made tough decisions and taken action in places, taking Chevy out of, of Europe, uh, restructuring our businesses in Indonesia, in Thailand, in Australia. So I think one of the things that is, a, is a very important is that we're making the tough decisions to make sure that the business that we have is going to be sustainable and generate a return uh, for our owners, for our shareholders. So we've been able to make those changes and stay flat with revenue while growing margins. So I think very, very significant when you look at that. We've got strong commitments for next year. But at the end of the day, when I look at the business, we, you know, we're in the top tier of the, of the, of the OEMs from a, from a volume and a scale perspective. But what we're looking at is how do, we don't have to be the largest. We have to be the highest quality. I mean, our goal is to be the most admired because we want to make sure we're generating that return and we're in, businesses, we're in places where the business is, is going to be successful over the cycle. Well, if I'm not uh, mistaken, one of the reasons that margins are up is that tr uh, trucks are selling so well. Is, isn't that true? That, that's one of the reasons, but also if you look at the new uh, cars, we just launched the Opel Astra in Europe. We're launching uh, several new Chevrolet models, uh, the Cruze, the Malibu, the Volt. All of those have um, uh, in profitability improvements uh, vehicle by vehicle. So we're looking at all aspects of the business. We've also taken our, our cost uh, down. So when you look at where over a cycle our break-even point is, it's much improved. So we're improving the fundamentals of the business. Yes, uh, we're enjoying a very strong truck market in the U.S. right now. But I think if you look at all as aspects of the business, we're really driving efficiency in everything we do. Um. Now, this is an unusual question because I want to bring a, a man into this discussion here. 
But um, you've gotten to know Warren Buffett over the last couple of years, and, and that occurred because uh, one of his investment lieutenants, um, uh, Ted Weschler, um, bought a significant amount of uh, GM stock. And I'm just curious, is there any, um, any uh, great thing that you've picked up from Warren Buffett that you would think had helped you in, in managing GM? Well, I, I think t two aspects. I mean, it's it's been you know just a, a real um, privilege to be able to to get to know Warren and, and get to you know learn from him. And I think one of the things is making sure that we're doing um, every decision we make in the company we're making on behalf of our owners, like we're an owner, not making short term decisions, but you know looking over the horizon of what's best for the company and for the long term. Uh, shareholder. So that's, you know, one question he asked me early on and we were very aligned. I would say also as we were going through the challenges last year, you know, he was, uh, you know, great at affirming, you know, that our strategy to do the right thing for the customer, do it right, do it fast, and and, and correct the situation uh, was absolutely right. And he, he it was so it was supportive of, of, you know, our thought and what we were executing, but it was sure nice to have his uh, vote of confidence on that. Well, and I'm going to tell him, tell you something that he said about you, but I'm going to keep everybody in suspense about that for, um, for a couple of questions. It looks like we have um, a, a chance to uh, have a question or two. How about right back here? Can we get a mic back there? Right there. Hi. Sheeta Bina from Insignium. Uh, Mary, recently this past week, Steve Odlin of the Committee for Economic Development contrasted your leadership of the GM crisis with the Volkswagen leadership, where you said, we've got to get to the bottom of this and clean it out. And the other conversation was, we have to contain this. So what I'm interested in is, what, has it, what have you had to demand from yourself as a leader in this journey that you've had in transforming the culture, the process you're in of transforming the culture. And what have you learned from that that you could give away? Well, I think, again, I can't comment on, on VW's situation, but you know what, what I've learned in, it, first of all, it was living our values. Because it's really easy to put you know, words on a piece of paper and when times are good, to say, yes, I live my values. The, where they're really tested or where you have moments of truth is, is, is when you're going through a difficult challenge. And what I'm really proud of, and, and this was not only myself, but my leadership team, we demonstrated our values. We put the customer in the center. We were, we were transparent. And I think that's vitally important, and that has really allowed us to emerge a much stronger company. Uh, and I would also say, you know, me personally, I'm a much more de determined person because of, you know, all of what we went through. We need to make sure that those lessons are learned that we never forget. And, you know, I live that every day, and I will for as long as I'm, you know, uh, in, in industry or, frankly, here. <laughs> One more question. Oh, hi, Mary. Over here in the back. Um, there are rumors that Apple is going to get into the car business. So can you comment on that rumor? And if they do get into it, what their strengths would be and what their weaknesses would be? Well, um, you know, I, I generally don't speculate and, and on rumors. But, you know, I would say there's a, there's a lot of conversation. We, we do work with Apple right now. In fact, we uh, enable Apple CarPlay into our vehicles right now. We the, have the broadest uh, vehicles that allow that um, or enable that in, in the United States and are looking at doing that globally as well. So I uh, have tremendous respect for the company. I think, you know, both uh, when you look at how um, – much software is on a vehicle right now. I mean, you know, right now the, the number of lines of code that we have in a vehicle are stunning. And so um, a great company. I think we have a lot of assets. I think they have uh, know-how as well. So, you know, we're focused on taking the company to the next, to the next level and, and really defining personal mobility inside and outside of the vehicle because as you are for sure going to need to get from point A to point B. The way you can do it can be dramatically different, whether it's with an electrified vehicle, whether it's with a self-driving vehicle, whether it's in a vehicle that you own in a different model or have access to in a different model. So that's what we're focused on. It's hard for me to speculate um, on Apple, but I would just say, you know, there's areas together today we're already working on. Um, all right, I'm going to go back on my word and get hey, one more question. Here we go. Hi, Lee Morgan with the Gates Foundation. As you look out the next 10 or 15 years, what's the next great disruption in, in the auto industry? 
Well, I think we're being disrupted right now. Um, in, in fact, I'm on record as saying I think in the next five to ten years we'll see more change in uh, the auto industry than we've seen in the last 50. And it's because of the technology that's available to vehicles. When you look at connectivity and embedded connectivity, uh, where you know General Motors has experience with that for 20 years with OnStar. When you look at autonomous and, and how we might be driving, again, personal um, ownership models, there's so much changing. But what we do know is even with any personal device we have, there are going to be times we need to go from here to there. And that's where we intend to uh, have a leadership role. Okay, it's time for me to give the Buffett uh, thing. But I will, I will say you go, when you're a uh, journalist, you go to all your obvious sources, and I knew he knew you, and so I asked him, uh, you know, what he thought about you, and he said you had lots of problems, and uh, <laughs> I'm getting, it's getting better than that. And um, uh, he said you needed to be good in Europe, you needed to be good in China. Uh, the de decline in China is obviously a problem for you. But then he said at the end, and he said, and you can quote me on this, if somebody gave me the job of running General Motors and I could pick anyone I act to do it, if I had first draft pick, I would pick Mary Barra. I would think then that I had the best person. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.